Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and to Farm Minister Park, Jin, to you, to your entire delegation from the Republic of Korea, welcome to the State Department. And I must say, it's also wonderful to see uh, my friend, the Ambassador, newly arrived in Washington, uh, here with us as well. Um, before I jump into talking about the extremely productive uh, meeting that we had, let me just say a few words uh, about the Summit of the Americas that we just wrapped up in Los Angeles at the end of last week. Um, as I think we saw in the many positive statements from leaders coming out of Los Angeles, this was a substantive and successful event that laid the foundation for enhanced regional cooperation. Um, countries made significant and concrete commitments on our whole range of issues that directly shape the lives of the people in our respective countries, from training 500,000 healthcare workers to turbocharging the transition to clean energy, to building a more inclusive digital economy, to forging the first truly regional approach to migration in the Los Angeles Declaration. Our conversations were intense uh, and intensive. Our goals are ambitious. And now, of course, the work begins to turn what was agreed in uh, Los Angeles into reality, to making those uh, commitments uh, concrete and real. And I have no doubt that all the engagement that happened in Los Angeles will pave the way to do just that. Um, here today, this is the Foreign Minister's first visit to Washington in his new role, and it comes quickly on the heels of the summit between President Yoon and President Biden in Seoul a few weeks ago. As President Biden said then and there, the alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States has never been stronger, it's never been more vibrant, it's never been more vital. Our discussion today reflected the full breadth uh, and depth of this partnership, as did Deputy Secretary Sherman's meetings in Seoul earlier this month. Uh, we probably could have gone on for another couple of hours um, covering uh, the world as we were. Um, now, we can't also forget the other very notable meeting between our countries recently, BTS visiting the White House. <laughs> for the BTS Army uh, in America, it was a thrilling day. Uh, and I have to tell you, uh, some of you may have noticed this, I had another K-pop moment myself a few weeks ago when I was on uh, the, the Late Show with Stephen Colbert. As we arrived at the Late Show, there was a huge crowd um, at the backstage door. And for a minute, I have to admit, I thought, well, maybe they're here to see me. No. Uh, there was a K-pop group twice that was also uh, on the show that night. That's why they were there. And by the way, they were terrific. So. There's no question that the ties between our countries are strong and incredibly broad as well. Um, and through this alliance, founded in shared sacrifice, deepened over nearly 70 years, our countries are taking on urgent challenges and also seizing opportunities together. So to name just a few of the issues that we talked about in some detail today. First, we are coordinating closely with each other on the threat posed by the DPRK's unlawful nuclear and ballistic missile programs. The recent increase in Pyongyang's ballistic missile testing has raised tension throughout the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. We continue to seek the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And let me emphasize that the United States has absolutely no hostile intent toward the DPRK. We're open to dialogue without preconditions. We want to support the people of North Korea, including with COVID-19 vaccines. Indeed, we have offered our help consistently uh, throughout the pandemic and again during the awful surge that they are now enduring, which comes on top of severe economic and humanitarian crises. Our goal, simply put, is a peaceful and stable region and world. Until the regime in Pyongyang changes course, we will continue to keep the pressure on. Just as important as what we're doing is how we're doing it, together, together with the international community. For example, a few weeks ago, the United Nations Security Council voted 13 to 2 to impose stronger sanctions on the DPRK in the wake of unprecedented, an unprecedented number of provocative uh, missile tests, including with ICBMs. All, all the non-permanent members of the Council voted for the resolution. Only China and Russia opposed it. Uh, and with Japan and the Republic of Korea, two of our closest allies, we are working trilaterally. Uh, to address the threat posed by the DPRK and to tackle other pressing regional challenges, including, for example, restoring Burma to a democratic path, supporting ASEAN, 
accelerating women's empowerment. All this work is grounded in our shared values as democracies and our shared commitment to human rights. And the United States is committed to helping our partners work through challenges in their relationship, which is in the collective interest of the region and of people in all three countries. Um, second, we are working very closely with the Republic of Korea and other partners to develop the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which our countries launched together in Tokyo last month, along with 11 others. Uh, this will put in place a robust foundation for strong and sustainable economic growth across an incredibly dynamic region. Our countries share a commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific where innovation flourishes, supply chains are secure, labor and environment standards are high, and the rules of the road give workers and businesses from all countries an equal chance to compete and to succeed. The bilateral economic relationship between the Republic of Korea and the United States is one of the strongest in the world. We're your second largest trading partner. You're our sixth largest. We're the second largest investor in your economy. You invest more in the United States than you do in any other country. In so many ways, we are profoundly linked together uh, through our economics. Samsung is building a semiconductor factory in Texas, which will create thousands of jobs here in the United States. Hyundai has announced more than $11 billion in new investments in American manufacturing including a new electric vehicle plant uh, and battery factory in Georgia that will, again, create thousands of jobs. These partnerships between leading global Korean companies and American workers and communities will yield benefits for both of our countries and bring us even closer together. Third, we are standing together on global security challenges, including President Putin's unprovoked war on Ukraine. Since the war began in February, the Republic of Korea has coordinated sanctions and export controls alongside the United States and other allies and partners. It's taken steps to help stabilize energy markets. It's offered significant economic and humanitarian support to the government and people of Ukraine. We will discuss these and other issues in depth uh, later this month when President Yoon joins the NATO summit in Madrid together with other allies and partners from the Indo-Pacific region. Across these and other issues, the Republic of Korea and the United States are united. We're working together to promote peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. We're connected by people-to-people -people ties going back generations, including nearly 40,000 Korean students who came to the United States in the last academic year, more per capita than from any other country. Former Mr. Park uh, earned degrees from not one, but two uh, American universities. He knows the power of these exchanges. So do we. In the 140 years since our countries established diplomatic relations, we've grown closer in every conceivable way. As under President Yoon's administration, that is sure to continue, especially, especially as the ROK assumes its vital role as a global pivotal state. So, Jen, thank you again for being here in Washington. Thank you for the very, very good uh, conversation uh, between us and between our teams. Uh, a lot ahead of us, but for today, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tony, for the warm welcome and the incredible hospitality. I would also like to thank your excellent team at the State Department for their work in preparing today's meeting. My first official order of business after arriving in Washington, D.C. yesterday was to lay a wreath at the Korean War Memorial and pay tribute to the heroic U.S. soldiers who sacrificed for freedom. While there, I had a chance to meet with uh, American families visiting the memorial and was pleased to learn that the families were proud descendants of the Korean War veterans, Army soldiers and Marines who have passed away. I think they were pleasantly surprised to see the Korean foreign minister there. Today, Secretary Blinken and I had a very productive and comprehensive dialogue over lunch on a wide range of shared agenda. I'm also pleased I had this opportunity to get to know Secretary Blinken on a personal level. Today's meeting takes place at an especially critical moment. First, it comes on the heels of the successful summit meeting between President Yoon and President Biden three weeks ago in Seoul where they reaffirmed their commitment to strengthening the alliance. Secretary Blinken and I 
discuss ways to build on the strong momentum created by the summit so early in President Yoon's term and to promptly implement the agreements reached by our two presidents. Second, our alliance is confronting increasingly complex challenges, including destabilizing actions by North Korea, the war in Ukraine, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, supply chain disruptions, food and energy crisis, climate change, and others. As allies that share core values, such as democracy and human rights, Korea and the United States are natural partners for tackling these tasks. This is what we mean when we commit to developing a truly global, comprehensive, strategic alliance. Secretary Blinken and I also share our assessment on the series of recent uh, missile launches by North Korea, as well as prospects of further provocations. We affirm that any North Korean provocations, including a nuclear test, will be met with a united and firm response from our alliance and the international community. We expressed special concern over North Korea's increasingly aggressive uh, rhetoric regarding the use of tactical nuclear weapons. And we agreed that North Korea issue is one of the top policy priorities for the United States and the Republic of Korea. Pyongyang's continuous provocations will only lead to strengthened deterrence of the alliance and stronger international sanctions measures. With a shared understanding of the importance of extended deterrence Secretary Blinken and I agreed on the early reactivation of the high-level extended deterrence strategy and consultation group. As a follow-up to the summit meeting in May, the EDSCG will serve as a timely and effective mechanism to discuss concrete extended deterrence measures as well as to send North Korea a firm message. We also discussed concrete ways to close the loopholes in the implementation of existing sanctions, as well as ways to further strengthen the sanctions regime. At the same time, we have been very clear that we remain committed to dialogue and diplomacy. We are prepared to take a more flexible and open-minded approach to diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. We seek dialogue with North Korea without preconditions. We urge North Korea to cease destabilizing actions and return to dialogue. We also reaffirmed our willingness to provide COVID-19 related humanitarian assistance to North Korea. Irrespective of political considerations, we hope that Pyongyang will respond positively to this offer. The 21st century us rock alliance is about more than the security terms, security realm. It is now an economic security alliance and a tech alliance. Korea as a global pivotal state, or GPS, stands ready to assume a more active role in advancing freedom, peace, and democracy around the globe. Today, Secretary Blinken and I spend significant time discussing ways to address complex economic challenges so that the United States and Korea can work hand in glove to benefit our business corporations and better the lives of our citizens in tangible ways. We also discussed addressing the all important global supply chain issue. I express Korea's full support for the upcoming Ministerial on Global Supply Chain Resilience to be co-hosted by Secretary Blinken and Secretary Raimondo. Our two countries will also engage at the expert working level to strengthen supply chain early warning systems so that we can prevent damaging disruptions. 
Additionally, we discussed ways to scale up civil nuclear cooperation regarding partnership in overseas nuclear markets and small modular reactors. Secretary Blinken and I reiterate our commitment to strengthening efforts for a swift conclusion of the war and restoration of peace in Ukraine. Korea stands with the United States and the international community against Russia's illegal actions. We also acknowledge the importance of maintaining a prosperous and peaceful Indo-Pacific. I shared Korea's plan to formulate our own Indo-Pacific strategy, which would implement our global pivotal state across the region. Secretary Blinken welcomed Korea's initiative to embrace greater regional and global responsibilities. I also expressed Korea's desire to work closely with the United States and other partners to develop the IPEF or IPEF into an open, transparent, and inclusive platform for promoting peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. We walk forward, we look forward to engaging in discussions to flesh out the four pillars. After today's meeting, I could not be more confident that our alliance is stronger than it has ever been. Once again, I would like to thank Tony for today's productive discussions and look forward to working closely with him as close partners. We are on the same page on many issues. I hope to see you in Seoul again to continue these important talks and to reciprocate your warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now turn to questions. We'll start with Sean Tandon of the AFP. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I was going to ask about BTS, but you already addressed it. Uh, so. um, uh, could I ask you both uh, to follow up on, uh, on North Korea? Um, you both mentioned the possibility of a nuclear test. How concerned are you at, at, at this point about that happening? Uh, you both said that, that the United States and the Republic of Korea are willing to meet without preconditions. Does that offer still stand even if they go ahead with a nuclear test? Uh, and if I get to ask another issue that, that affects both countries, uh, Iran. Uh, Foreign Minister Park, there's been a long-standing row with Iran over uh, frozen funds. Uh, do you believe that that's any closer to resolution? And Mr. Secretary, uh, regarding what Iran's actions last week uh, reading the IAEA, uh, do you still see hope for diplomacy? Where do you th see things standing now? Or are you hopeful of resuming something at some point? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Jen, I'm happy to start. If you... Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, so with regard to, um, Sean, to a nuclear test, um, we remain uh, concerned about the prospects for what would be a seventh nuclear test uh, over multiple administrations. Um, we know that the North Koreans have done preparations for such a test. Uh, we are being extremely vigilant uh, about that. We're in very close touch with uh, our close allies and partners, starting with the Republic of Korea, uh, also with Japan and others, uh, to be able to respond quickly uh, should the North Koreans proceed with, uh, with such a test. Um, I can say simply for today that we're preparing for all contingencies, uh, again, in very close coordination uh, with others, notably with the ROK and with, uh, with Japan. Uh, and we are prepared to make both short and longer term adjustments to our military posture as appropriate. Uh, a nuclear test would be dangerous. It would be deeply destabilizing uh, to, uh, to the region. It would blatantly violate international law. Uh, as set out in multiple United Nations Security Council resolutions. So we urge the DPRK to refrain from further destabilizing activity. We call on the DPRK to engage in serious and sustained diplomacy. And indeed, in that regard, we are prepared, as we have been, uh, to proceed with no preconditions. Uh, and as I said uh, earlier, and I'll repeat now, we have no hostile intent toward the DPRK. Uh, but our efforts to um, uh, engage without preconditions thus far have not been met with a response from the DPRK. In fact, the only response we've seen thus far has been this multiplicity of, uh, of missile tests, including uh, ICBMs. With regard to the JCPOA, and we've spoken to this repeatedly in recent days, um, a lot of work 
went into uh, seeing if we could return to mutual compliance with the uh, uh, JCPOA, uh, working with the European Union, uh, working with European partners, working as well with China and Russia over the past uh, year uh, or more. And it is fundamentally up to Iran to decide whether or not it wishes to re-engage in that agreement, because the work in terms of re-engaging that agreement has, for the most part, uh, been, been completed. But what we've seen is Iran continuing to try to inject extraneous issues into the, uh, into the conversation, into the negotiation, uh, that simply have no, uh, no place there. So they have to decide, um, and decide very quickly if they wish to proceed with what has been uh, negotiated and which could be completed quickly if Iran chose to do so. Uh, separately but relatedly, of course, are Iran's obligations uh, under the uh, nonproliferation regime uh, to its commitments to the IEA, uh, including commitments that it has dodged for a long period of time, to the point where it was important for the IEA uh, to uh, express through the resolution of the Board of Governors, uh, its deep concern with, the, with Iran's failure to comply. And now Iran has taken steps in response to the IEA uh, that make uh, things even more challenging, including a return to the JCPOA, as it, for example, pulls cameras out of places where the IEA had been placed for, for monitoring. One of the uh, great benefits of the JCPOA was the most comprehensive and complete monitoring and inspections regime of any arms control agreement uh, yet, yet put in place. If the Iranians are uh, dismantling that at the same time, then I think that makes the possibilities of return to compliance uh, even more, uh, more remote. So fundamentally, it's, uh, it's up to Iran, uh, and uh, we'll see quickly, I would imagine, what it, uh, what it proposes to do uh, by its actions, and the actions that we've seen are not encouraging. Um, all right, I think that uh, North Korea has now finished the preparation for another nuclear test, and I think only political decision um, has to be made. If North Korea uh, ventures into another nuclear test, and I think that it will only strengthen uh, our deterrence and also international sanctions, um, and it will only isolate North Korea from the international community. Uh, and certainly we need to push for a new UN Security Council resolution to deal with North Korea's provocation, as we have discussed today. Um, so the lesson that North Korea should learn is that the more provocations they make, the more isolated they will become. And in fact, it will undermine its own national security. Uh, with regard to Iran, we want to have a mutually beneficial relationship. Although we have some obstacles of frozen fund, uh, Korea will uh, discuss it with Iran and also with the United States. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, JCPOA negotiations, uh, we hope that this issue can be resolved as soon as possible. And if that uh, happens, then I think that these obstacles uh, could be uh, fixed as well. So uh, we need more diplomacy and dialogue uh, with Iran uh, in order that we can have a positive result out of the negotiations on the nuclear issue. We'll turn to Park Hyung Young with Junong Ilba. <coughs> For this opportunity, um, Secretary Blinken and Minister Park, you didn't mention to what extent the U.S. would provide extended deterrence to South Korea, uh, with North Korea expected to conduct its nuclear test and becoming more and more capable with its weapons program. Um, would you agree that extended deterrence is one of the most realistic solutions to protect the Korean Peninsula? And um, could you give us more detail on what U.S. and ROK agreed upon, and um, if you have a time schedule to reactivate the extended uh, deterrence strategy consultation group, the EDSCG? And my second question is, um, the new South Korean government uh, vowed to strengthen U.S. ROK alliance beyond military alliance that has been the core of the relationship for decades, um, closer alignment with U.S. policies and deepening economic and security ties like joining the IPATH uh, with the U.S. could potentially make uh, South Korea's relationship with China suffer, um, like what happened when U.S. missile defense 
system was deployed to South Korea in 2017. Um, so if this happens again, um, Chinese bullying or economic punishment, what can Koreans expect from the Biden administration? Thank you. Um, happy to start again, Jin. Uh, thank you very much. First, um, it's very simple. The United States is committed to extended deterrence. And that commitment uh, will also take the form of, as we've discussed, reestablishing the extended deterrence group, uh, the working group. And my expectation, I think the minister's expectation, is that that will uh, get up and working very, very soon in the, in the weeks ahead. Uh, so that's something we discussed. I won't go into any further uh, detail on the, uh, on the substance, but I can tell you that we're committed to extended deterrence and we're committed to restarting the, the work of this group in the weeks ahead. Um, with regard to the second part of your, of your question, um, the relationships that we have uh, around the world um, are not designed to be zero sum when it comes to China. For example, we're not about decoupling the economic and investment relationship between other countries and, and China, or for that matter, our own. On the contrary, we see tremendous value in, in, in those relationships. But there are certain aspects of the, just to cite the example of the trade and economic relationship, that are very important that we discuss today. One is that I think for uh, many countries, um, the lack of reciprocity in the economic and trade relationship is both unacceptable and unsustainable. That is, China imposes uh, conditions and does things to our companies and uh, business people engaged in trade and investment in China that we do not uh, impose on them. And that simply uh, can't last. And I think you're seeing countries around the world come together on that uh, proposition. Similarly, even as we support trade uh, investment, and even as we do not seek to decouple uh, our, our economies, there are certain very specific aspects of our economies that are of strategic importance or that have a security implication where we have to be very vigilant because there is no distinction between Chinese companies and the Chinese state. Indeed, under Chinese law, companies that engage in investment and, uh, and business are required at the request of the government to share any information that they've acquired as a result of these economic relationships with, uh, with Beijing. And that presents in certain areas something that we have to be very vigilant about because uh, it could uh, become a security uh, or strategic issue. So that's the nature of the, uh, of the conversation. But more broadly, let me just add this. Um, for us, and I had an opportunity to speak to this about a week ago um, in, in, in discussing uh, the Biden administration's approach to China, our approach is not about holding China back or trying to keep it down. It's about upholding what we commonly refer to as the rules-based international order. Uh, the rule of law uh, system that has been put in place to try to uh, govern relations among uh, nations in a way that upholds peace and security, minimizes the potential for conflict, and allows everyone uh, to engage in a race to the top uh, where we all flourish and all succeed. When that order uh, is, is challenged by anyone, we'll defend it. And in fact, we'll, we'll do it together. Uh, but uh, again, this is not designed to be uh, zero sum. It's designed to be a race to the top in which everyone, we hope China included, uh, is prepared to engage. Yeah. Um, the question you have raised about uh, extended deterrence and um, IPEF, uh, we uh, discussed uh, before uh, today uh, between two of us. Um, extended deterrence uh, strategy and consultation group meeting, uh, we agreed, should be reactivated as soon as possible uh, because it deals with Korean security, uh, peace and stability, and also including the timely deployment of strategic assets when necessary. And of course, the uh, restoration of the uh, Korea-US joint military exercise will certainly help uh, bring about more safe uh, uh, environment on the Korean Peninsula. I already mentioned the need for pushing the new UN Security Council resolution in case North Korea comes up with another nuclear test. Um, 
Concerning IPEF, the basic approach that uh, this uh, forum has taken is that this forum should not alienate uh, or exclude any one specific country. Uh, the basic idea is to have a more inclusive, transparent, uh, and also flexible uh, forum where uh, joining uh, participants can discuss the future of the region and how to create a new uh, laws and norms so that uh, member countries uh, can uh, operate together in the area of trade, supply chains, uh, energy, clean energy, and tax and anti-corruption. And I think that uh, the, the real question is whether China would be willing to accept the norms and the regulations uh, so that we can have a mutually beneficial relationship uh, in the region. So I hope that IPEF can create a better uh, world for the future through the um, establishment of new uh, regional uh, trade and investment and also uh, economic security framework in the region. Nike Ching, BOA. Good afternoon, Secretary Blinken. Good afternoon, Minister Park. On North Korea, North Korea has des appointed its first female foreign minister and also announced a partial reshuffle of its military leadership. What is your read to these personnel, um, personnel change? Is it an indication of shift, shift of approach by North Korea toward the U.S. and South Korea? Separately, if I may, Secretary Blinken, sanctions have not been working to deter North Korea from further provocation. Uh, given the division within the United Nations Security Council, are unilateral punitive measures by the United States targeting Chinese and Russia individuals and, and entities uh, supporting North Korea's weapon programs on the table? And to Minister Park, do you see your United States play a role to revive the intelligence sharing pact between the Japan and Korea? Thank you very much. Thank you, Nike. Um, we have noted the appointment of a new foreign minister uh, in, uh, in North Korea, but our approach is not predicated or dependent on specific individuals. It's focused entirely on the, the policies that a given country uh, is pursuing. Um, and as I said, and just to reiterate, we remain committed, as is uh, the Republic of Korea, to diplomacy and to dialogue. Um, we've had multiple senior U.S. officials, uh, including the President, myself, repeatedly and publicly affirm that we seek diplomacy with the DPRK without preconditions. Uh, and I repeated it again today. Uh, I also reiterated that we have no hostile intent toward the DPRK. So. We'll continue to reach out uh, to the DPRK. We're committed to pursuing uh, a diplomatic approach. Um, unfortunately, to date, what we've seen from the DPRK is the opposite. I hope they'll respond differently. With regard to sanctions and pressure, um, virtually all of this is coordinated closely with other countries, and uh, it's pursuant to UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, North Korea is in violation of many of them, uh, and, and repeatedly so. When it comes to uh, targeting those who are supporting uh, North Korea's missile or, or nuclear program. That's already what we're doing. Uh, we, uh, we have imposed sanctions of one kind or another on uh, individuals and entities, including Russian and Chinese individual and entities, that are aiding and abetting those programs. We'll continue to do so. Well, I think that uh, North Korea <clears throat> should change its mind and make a right decision. Uh, so uh, rather than spending its budget for launching nuclear, uh, uh, testing nuclear bomb or launching missiles, they should spend their budget for the well-being of the people. Now, we know that uh, Corona-19 uh, uh, pandemic uh, is affecting people's lives in North Korea. North Korea has uh, voluntarily admitted the problems that they have. Um, so as long as North Korea continues on its belligerent posture, as I mentioned, it will only isolate the country. Uh, with regard to Jisomia, uh, we want Jisomia to be normalized as soon as possible, together with the improvement of Korea-Japan relationship 
in order to deal with the threat from North Korea, we need to have a policy coordination and the sharing of information between Korea and Japan and with the United States. So uh, I hope that this uh, um, security cooperation and the sharing of information can be normalized as soon as possible. Our final question goes to Kim Young Soon with KBS. Hi, my name is Yang Soon Kim from KBS. It's really nice to see you, Minister Park, in here. Yeah, welcome. I have a question to Blinken and uh, Minister Park too. Well, first of all, I've been working here from the inauguration of the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. From that time, uh, you guys revised the North Korean policy and put out the calibrated and the practical approach to mm -hmm. North Korea. But since then, as you mentioned and admitted, there's no response from the North Korea, and it looks like the sanction does work well. So do you have any other leverage to make a goal, a Korean peninsula denuclearization, or any other uh, thing to put a step forward to the nuclearization of the Korean peninsula, or you guys change or modification in the North Korean policy with the new, new government? Mm -hmm. And to the Minister Park, as you mentioned yesterday, the North Korea is ready to just push the button for the nuclear test. And do you think what will be the, the instigation to push the button? Because you, th you said that it will be the political action, then there will be like a, a Korean-U.S. A military joint, you know, army together things that will be an instigation or something like that. What will be the instigation? Thank you very much. So, as you noted, um, we've made clear for some time our willingness to uh, engage diplomatically and through dialogue with the DPRK uh, toward the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, for some time, we took time to engage in a full policy review at the uh, beginning of this administration. Uh, we completed that review, uh, and we've made clear, uh, as you said, to the DPRK as well as to others our uh, preparedness to engage uh, through dialogue and through diplomacy in trying to resolve uh, the issues and uh, to um, advance the prospects for a uh, genuinely peaceful peninsula. And unfortunately, again, as I've said, what we've seen to date has been no response from the DPRK. Uh, to the extent there's been a response of late, it has been a proliferation of missile tests, including ICBMs, and possibly now uh, a nuclear test. We've seen the preparations for that. That would be the seventh test over multiple uh, administrations, multiple uh, American administrations, multiple uh, Korean administrations. Um, we've also made clear that uh, unless and until the DPRK is engaged with us uh, and with partners and allies uh, in diplomacy and in dialogue, that the pressure will continue, uh, it will be sustained, and, as appropriate, it will be increased. Um, we've talked uh, today, and we will continue to talk with um, the ROK, uh, with Japan, with others, uh, about the most effective ways to do that. Um, and I can say that we are in full alignment when it comes to the approach that needs to be taken. Um, that pressure can not only be exerted by uh, our countries, but also by others in the international community, including through additional Security Council uh, resolutions and what uh, flows from that re from those resolutions. Um, at the same time, it is very important that we continue to strengthen uh, our own defense and deterrence uh, against uh, further action by the DPRK. Uh, this is something that we're also engaged in. Uh, we're committed, for example, to talking about how we expand uh, the scope and scale of combined military exercises for defensive and preparedness purposes, training uh, on and around the, uh, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and, of course, uh, we want to make sure that we have in place all the defensive capacity necessary to deal with any possible uh, provocation uh, or aggression coming from the DPRK. That is not what we're looking for. That is not our uh, goal or intent. To the contrary, uh, it's the peaceful resolution of uh, all of these differences toward a denuclearized Korean Peninsula, uh, to do that through diplomacy and dialogue. But we're going to be prepared either way. Um, and there is no daylight between the United States and the Republic of Korea when it comes to both aspects of that policy, being prepared fully to pursue diplomacy and dialogue, but also being prepared to deal with any provocation and any aggression coming from the DPRK. 
Um, I think that North Korea is at a crossroads now. It can go ahead with its nuclear test and isolate itself, or it can make a right decision and return to the diplomacy and, uh, and the dialogue. Uh, I hope North Korea can make the latter uh, choice uh, instead of uh, continuing on a dangerous course of action. Um, if North Korea somehow decides to go ahead with this nuclear test, then as I mentioned, uh, Korea and the United States uh, will react uh, with a firm position uh, through strength and deterrence and also through the UN Security Council resolution. And I also think that China should play a very positive role to persuade North Korea that uh, maintaining uh, peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula requires uh, their new thinking uh, and also uh, making a right decision at this important critical juncture. So um, I really hope that North Korea can look to the future uh, and makes the right decision. That concludes the press conference. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Thank you, everyone.